compared to a lot of you in New York City. Uh, as Doug said, I'm the product manager for mobile platform and was involved in the Open Graph launch at F8 in 2011. And one of the things I'm going to spend most of my time on talking about here are the challenges that we have with, with native mobile apps adopting Open Graph. Uh, and some of those I had uh, a pretty intimate hand in. So I, I'm glad to be able to stand up here and talk through how we're making Open Graph something easier for you, you to use inside native mobile apps. And so I appreciate all the stuff Rose just talked about, and especially the things she ended on, because I think it really highlights how structured data plays an important part in storytelling. And because the stories aren't just about the single run that Doug went on, but are about how you, see, you view his running activity over time and how you see those aggregations and the, the information kind of put together in that collection, and you see all those charts and graphs. And all that is made possible for us because we have all this structured data underlying the system in the form of actions and objects that get brought together to tell stories. And this is really different than platform stories that a lot of you, I'm sure a lot of you have been you know, playing with or using in your apps, Facebook platform, for a long time. If we think about the platform story model over the last several years, the platform story model is really centered around a basic little block of text that people can fill in. We call that the user message. And below that is this like, little rectangle that has a picture on the far left-hand side, a bolded, highlighted block of text called a title, a, a URL that sits behind that, and maybe a couple other lines of text. We think of this as unstructured sharing. APIs like Stream Publish and doing a post to slash me slash feed create those kinds of stories. But there's not a lot that we can do to kind of roll those stories together over time and look at somebody's activity and see those things in collections on timeline. So it's a fine tool for story telling stories in newsfeed, but it's not a particularly interesting tool for telling stories over time and timeline. And even in newsfeed, we can do a lot more interesting presentation with structured stories in the form of the maps that you saw of Doug's runs and the photos that Rose had that came in from Instagram. So I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about how you go through defining and telling us what kinds of stories you want to publish. And so you see all these stories flying through here. Climbed a mountain, hiked a trail, listened to a song, uh, and reviewed a restaurant. And so if we take review to restaurant and we kind of dissect it into pieces, there are three things that you need to come to us in our developer tool to configure to be able to tell this story. The first is the object, and here the object is the restaurant. And we need to understand what a restaurant means inside your apps. It probably you know, has all of these built-in properties like title and URL and image. It also probably has some properties that are custom that you would go in and add, like location. It might have hours of operation or a string that represents the type of cuisine that the, that the restaurant serves. And so that's an object. Um, second are these things called actions, and actions are the verbs, going back to Rose's slides. Actions are the verbs, and so that's reviewed. And I can perform lots of different kinds of verbs against these objects. I can review a restaurant, I can like a restaurant, I can recommend a restaurant, I can check in at a restaurant, and so on. And the same is true in fitness apps, or media apps, or other kinds of apps. Uh, but you come in and you tell us what a review looks like, and does it have text that's associated with the review? Is there a star rating that comes along with that review? And so you can kind of configure that in, a, in the, the developer dashboard that we have built into the dev tool. And so with those two bits of information, the action and the object, you can send us that data through APIs so that we can roll it all together and do something with it. But the way that you actually present it to people in newsfeed and timeline is by telling a story. And so you come and you create a story in the developer tool that takes the reviewed action and the restaurant object, wires them together, and then basically gives you text boxes that you can go and type and change the text of how those stories get told. And so those three things together are how you would use either what we call common, or in the past we called built-in actions. that really focused on media, so music, video, news. Uh, and you can come and create your custom ones, because obviously not all apps are media apps, not all apps are fitness apps. There are a lot of awesome apps out there that kind of require defining some of this custom stuff in order to be able to tell rich stories. OK, great. So that's basically like developer parlance for all the things you have to come and configure. Let's like fast forward into these uh, these challenges that we have uh, these challenges that we have on mobile. So the first challenge that we have with using Open Graph in native mobile is that we required you to go stand up web servers in order to host pages so that we could create these objects. And the solution to this problem that we're that we're launching today uh, is described in a developer blog post that should be live. Have APIs built into the SDKs and documentation on the developer site. It's called the Object API. And the object API, uh, we'll kind of get into all three of these things in a little bit more detail here on the, the kind of subsequent slides. The second challenge was representing user-generated content. 
So a lot of apps have content that is sort of shared by all users. If you watch movies in Netflix, we all share the same movie catalog. If you listen to music in Spotify, we all share the same music catalog. Uh, same thing for articles in the New York Times and other kinds of apps that have what we think of as kind of app-owned content, where there's content that the app sort of manages, and then users can connect to via actions on behalf of, uh, users can connect to the objects that the app hosts on behalf of users uh, via actions that people own. But that's not a particularly great fit for user-owned content. So user-owned content like photos, private notes or files that I want to share with certain friends uh, by setting an audience but not others. So we're introducing this concept of user-owned objects. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, are publishing tools. Platform long ago gave you publishing tools to be able to share platform stories via things like share.php in the feed dialog. Those things were typically web-based. Uh, and they typically kind of had a subset of the, the Facebook post model that could be used. And probably worse for adopting this structured sharing model, they didn't support open graph. And so we're introducing the native share dialog as a way to kind of fix all of those problems and have this nice turnkey, as Doug described, kind of like button-esque sharing experience from iOS. We're launching this dialog in beta today. Uh, it's beta because we have a few more features we want to add to it before we launch it publicly and some kind of bug fixing and stability stuff. But you guys have the ability through the new SDK uh, to go and start using this in your apps in debug mode today. So let's drill into the object API a little bit. So anybody that's uh, Open Graph, people that have played with Open Graph, used Open Graph in apps? OK, awesome. So you guys understand what this page means. I have a recipe. That recipe has a bunch of meta tags that are kind of, you know, if you view source on the page, you'll see these RDFA compliant, like semantic web meta tags that basically describe the properties and type of object we want to create from this page. And we create an object from this page when I come in and say, I cooked an instance of this recipe. So I cooked this recipe. That causes a Facebook web crawler to run out fetch the page, parse all the HTML out of it, look for these meta tags, read the values of the properties, and then in our servers create this little object, that, this, this open graph object of type meal that we then wire into our graph. It's kind of the weirdest object instantiation model anybody has ever had to deal with. If you're in Java or Python or PHP or any, any other environment that has, sort of, that has objects, you can just like write code to new one up, set some properties on it, and save it to a data store. And that's basically what we're adding here. And here's the Objective-C version of that exact same code. Uh, so instead of defining those meta tags off on the web page, you would define them in code. You could call this API from curl. You can call it from a request API in Python. Here we're calling it from uh, an API in Objective-C via the 3.5 SDK. And so what we see here, and there's a syntax error in this slide, and so uh, I'll give you a beer later if you, uh, if you can find it for me. Um, here what we see is we see we create a, an, a Facebook graph object. We take that object, we set some properties on it. They're the exact same values of properties that you saw on the previous slide. We're just setting them in code here. And then we hand it to FB request connection. We send that thing to the server and through the graph API, and we create an instance of this object in the graph. And once this thing is live here, we can start publishing actions against it just as we would before. But the beauty of this is it's easier to kind of fit into your workflow. For me as a developer, I want APIs that I can call and test, make sure work, make sure work in my apps flow. And I don't really want to outsource kind of all of that work to the Facebook web crawler necessarily if that's not a good fit for my app. And so we think this, this makes it easier for native mobile apps to take advantage of Open Graph because they don't have to go up and stand up an Apache server and host a templating library and define web pages simply to create objects that help tell these rich structured stories. So that's sort of the first solution, excuse me, the first solution to kind of this, this web server problem. So next, uh, user-owned objects. And user-owned objects are really interesting because it's not really a code change per se. It's more of a kind of conceptual and semantic change in the way that we think about objects in uh, structured stories. And so I'll give you an example. Um, imagine that I have a photo sharing app. And the story I want to share is Eddie uploaded photos. And the photos I uploaded are of my sister's kids. They're of my nieces. I really want to share those to my family. I don't necessarily want to share those to my coworkers at Facebook or my other friends that I go climbing with. I just want to send those pictures to my family. In the past, if you wanted to send those pictures to your family, you'd have to attach them to the action. And if you go back to the slides at the beginning and you think about Rose's talk, if you want to tell a story, Eddie uploaded photos, it makes a lot more sense to have those photos attached to the object. But because the only thing in the previous Open Graph system that had an audience associated with it was the action, you had to attach those images 
to the action itself. We're fixing that by adding this thing called user-owned objects. And user-owned objects basically make it so you can create objects that have an audience associated with them. So the photo example is a good one in terms of sharing photos of my nieces just with my family. Another example is a to-do list that Doug and Rose and I could have used to collaborate on putting together the like, tasks and work items that we needed to do to, to finish pulling this keynote together. And so here we see a story in Newsfeed that fits the, the Open Graph model, and it has a, uh, a user-owned object that sits behind it. And I, as Eddie, own the object, and I've decided to specifically share it with Doug and Rose. So they can see it in their news feeds, but all of our other coworkers at Facebook can't, and certainly all the rest of public or my friends can't, because otherwise all the things that we're doing for this keynote and the stuff we're announcing today would have been public long ago. So because this story is user-owned and because I can show it to specific people by setting an audience on the object, and because I can go into my activity log and delete it later if I want to, we think we've basically taken Open Graph and opened it up to a whole new class of apps that are about limiting the audience of certain content that we want to have be able to be shared on Newsfeed or in Timeline, but that previously kind of either created weird or wonky kind of stories that didn't fit well into the structured story model or weren't, simply weren't shared at all. And so other kinds of content you might see here, um, notes, photos, check-ins, if I wanted to check into places, like if I wanted to have my house represented as a place and I wanted to limit who could see that thing, all of those kinds of objects that you might want to like, limit the distribution audience of by setting a, a, an audience for stories that you see in Newsfeed. And finally, and perhaps this is the thing that I'm kind of the most excited about because it's such a change for us from all of the UI we've been giving you uh, to do story publishing and have kind of turnkey sharing from your apps, all of it being web-based and having some kind of odd user experiences. We're really excited about the native share dialog and be giving you uh, simple APIs through the SDKs that you can use to pop open UI like this. And so let me lock, walk through the way this works, because this is sort of a, you've seen this with the Facebook app, where when you use Facebook login in your apps, there's this fast app switch from your app to the Facebook app to show the login dialogues that Doug showed earlier. And in the past, those were rendered via the web. And now they're rendered in native, and they give users a really fast, really kind of idiomatic experience on the device. We've done the same thing here with sharing. And so with sharing in the past, you would have seen one of these little springy like feed dialogues that pops up and has the gray border around it with a little gray X in the upper left-hand corner. And it loads HTML, JavaScript, and CSS into a web page. And so you display this web page. And it has the old school kind of platform attachment associated with it and a little text area that people can type in. But it didn't have people tagging. So I, your apps didn't get as much distribution as they could have from stories shared through those apps. Because their, people can't tag their friends and have those stories show up in their friends' news feeds. It didn't get place tagging, so people couldn't say, I did this thing at this place. It didn't get an audience selector, so people didn't have control over the audience in the same way that we expect to give them control in the Facebook story model. And it didn't support open graph. And, so, and the, the kind of the funny thing about this is that in order to publish open graph actions, we basically made you use Facebook login because you had to ask for publishing permission and then make graph API calls. And that's a good fit for some apps. And we've seen a lot of success from apps that have used Facebook login uh, to be able to publish these stories. But we also wanted apps that don't use Facebook login or to, to allow users who choose not to log in with Facebook to still be able to share back into the graph and tell their friends these rich structured stories. And so now we can do that with the share dialog, because the notion of identity is picked up from the Facebook app on the device, as opposed to having the Facebook identity represented in every single app that a, that a user uses by typing their username and password into web pages uh, that are rendered inside these apps in the feed dialog. And so the way this works are these three lines of code. And the third line I broke across a few lines, so it's a little bit easier to read, but there's just one semicolon, so, uh, so it still counts as one line. Um, what we see here is we see an FB open graph action at the top. And we're going to take the action, we're going to point it at an app-owned object, because here it's a book, so it's Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. And the story is, I read a book. And the attachment object is Snow Crash. And this just makes the most sense, uh, because books tend to be shared in apps like Goodreads. But in some other apps, so for example, for user-generated content, I could also create an object here and pass that along here as well, and have all of that stuff get created through the share dialog via uh, kind of this single API. And what you see at the bottom here is a new class called FB Dialogs and a new function called present share dialog with open graph action. And we attach the action. We tell, we tell the SDK which type of action we want to publish. So we don't want to like the book. We want to read the book. 
and we say which property name we want to use to generate the preview for that attachment that you see in the share dialog back on the previous slide. Once that's done, we're going to make a fast app switch to the Facebook app, show people the story that they're going to see, give them the ability to tag friends, tag a place, set an audience, choose whether to post or not, and they click post or cancel, we'll come back here, tell you what happened, and your apps can kind of go on their merry way. But this is three lines of code to kind of drop a very powerful, very expressive sharing model into your apps. And so we think this is something that we're, we're really excited to see how apps that are using feed dialog today migrate to using this. And if you're wondering about kind of previous styles of platform stories, so link shares and status updates, those are supported here as well. And those methods are also on the FB Dialogs class. And if you're worried that when we come back to your app, you're going to have to do a bunch of work in your open URL handler, we've introduced a new class called FB App Call that we wrote docs for, and you'll see inside the 3.5 SDK, that make it really easy to handle the calls coming back from the Facebook app to your app after SSO finishes, so after Facebook login completes, uh, after the share dialog completes, and if your app is set up to handle deep links that come from the Facebook app when people click on stories in their newsfeed. Those, those things all get handled through FB App Call. And so you can use FB App Call as kind of this one-stop shop for letting the SDK help you handle all of that stuff, and then just return to the previous view controllers that you had open in your apps. So we're really excited to see how, uh, how apps adopt this. And third, and, and Doug alluded to this, uh, this object browser and these new graph APIs, this is kind of the cherry on top of a lot of this stuff. Because one of the other pieces of feedback we've heard from developers over the last 18 months is that Open Graph's great, but it's really, really hard for me to debug because I can't go in and figure out what objects I have published into Facebook for people to be able to kind of connect to and tell stories. And so we're introducing the object browser. And the object browser is a developer tool. It's built into the dev app. It has a very, if you used you know, PHP My Admin or sort of other sort of SQL admin interfaces, it has a very similar interface to that. The difference is that what it does is it ties into uh, objects that your apps have published into the graph. It supports app-owned objects. It supports user-owned objects. You can change between whether you want to view objects as a user, so to see user-owned objects, or as the app to see the app-owned objects. Each of the columns represents fields on those objects, and each of the rows represents an instance of one of those objects. And so you can see type of the object, the image, the title, the URLs, to just make sure that all the things you're doing with objects actually came into our system in the way that you, you think that they should have. And so if you find bugs here, you know, things that aren't right, you can go back and fix those things in your apps. And this tool is built on top of a set of graph APIs that we're also making available today so that you can go and get all of these objects out of the system to make sure that they either ha were published as you expect them to uh, and so on. And so those graph APIs let you check, uh, you know, uh, sorry, those graph APIs uh, work for user-owned objects and app-owned objects and are uh, kind of a superset of the graph APIs we've had in the past that kind of had a funny way of reading objects uh, from each of the users that had published, but no way to just go to the app and say, hand me back all my objects. I want to see if I published this new album from Justin Bieber. So that kind of sums up a lot of the details of, at a high level, of the things that we're launching today around uh, mobile platform. Um, we're pretty excited to see the things that you guys go and build into your apps, uh, because we think that this all leads to a better experience for using Open Graph inside native mobile apps, and through things like user-owned objects, kind of opens native mobile apps to sh structured sharing experiences that, we, that Open Graph kind of was either hard to use or wasn't used for in the past. Uh, and so with that, uh, there will be a handful of sessions later today around iOS and Open Graph that will drill into all this stuff in more detail and build apps from scratch. And so Prashant and Christine will be talking about all this stuff. Um, iOS SDK 3.5 comes out today. All this stuff is enabled for you guys through that SDK. We're working on this stuff for Android, and we'll have an SDK and share dialog out for Android sometime soon. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back over to Doug, who's going to come up and introduce Simon, who will end up talking about games.